Good evening, and welcome to the Osteopathic Founders Foundation ECME Clinical Update for March. I'm Sherry Wise, CEO of the Foundation, and I want to thank you for your attendance during this spring break week. Um, this evening, we're just presenting a discussion on PrEP and PEP, and we're very, very fortunate to have as our presenter Dr. Greg Gray, whom some of you may know more fondly as Radar. Greg is an associate professor of clinical education at the OSU Center for Health Sciences and an emergency medicine, medicine physician at St. Francis Hospital South for another minute. He's a graduate of the OSU College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed his emergency medicine residency at Oklahoma State University Medical Center. Really, it was at TRNC. Dr. Gray serves as a member of the Board of Directors of Health Outreach Prevention and Education Tulsa and as medical director and a volunteer physician at the Hope Clinic. Dr. Gray has no financial disclosures in relationship to this presentation. So I hope you'll join me now in welcoming Dr. Gray Gray. Well, thank you everybody. Um, I wanna welcome the folks that are in Hawaii who have uh, signed in from poolside at some conference there. Hello, Dr. Lakin, and I uh, also want to welcome my sister who drove from Durant, Oklahoma, back home to Coleman, Oklahoma, to jump on very quickly, as well as everybody from California, Alaska, and the East Coast that have jumped in here. Hopefully, this is going to be a great lecture for you to use. Please feel free to download my handout. I have a lot of references in it, and what I did, just to kind of go over a little bit, is I've kind of uh, gone over all the new guidelines that have come out from CDC, a good inch thick worth of guidelines over the last two years. And I'm going to kind of just nail those down a little bit for you and make this easy so that PEP, post-exposure protocol to HIV, and PrEP, pre-exposure pre -exposure protocol or prophylaxis, depending upon uh, what magazine you're reading, will help you in your practices and help our patients. Now let's go on. Now I have this pointer here. I need to point out that is now upside down because the pointers did just the opposite. So if I drop it, we may be going backwards. Now, just to let you know, the only conflict of interest I have is I do root for the Oklahoma State University Cowboys um, and when they're playing against OU. Otherwise I, I root for both OU and Oklahoma State University. All right, the objectives today. We're going to go over just a brief history of HIV in America. We're going to, I want you to understand how we can prevent HIV by the end of this lecture. And I want you to know the difference between PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis, and post-exposure prophylaxis, and what settings the protocols are for each of those. Understand what you need to know for each of these. And we're going to talk about some medications that are on the market, some a medication that's just been approved by CDC that's an injection once every two months. We're going to talk about special circumstances and where you may need to get on one of the hotlines that I'm going to give you information on uh, as far as things like pregnancy, adolescence, um, and certain specific situations where it would take a, a whole separate lecture to discuss that today. All right, let's go over a little bit of history about HIV. Our first real case that now looking back, we now know was HIV was finally diagnosed or reported by the CDC on June 5th, 1981. Uh, and back then, that was the first case of AIDS, and we really didn't know what was going on. We didn't know if it was a virus, we didn't know if it was bacteria, we, didn't, we did not know. And uh, we didn't know that it was preventable, we had no meds for it at the time, and not until 1989 did we start getting some experimental medications that we could use to maybe either slow down the process uh, or prevent transmission from mothers to children. Uh, and it wasn't until, hey, a person we might all know, Dr. Anthony Fauci, I think we've heard him uh, on TV over the last few years, or I think we are all now amateur virologists after HIV, tick-borne diseases, um, coronaviruses, Ebola viruses. We are all now becoming uh, amateur virologists in, in our medical practices. 1990 was the first year we really had some money to start treating people on a regular basis, and that created the Ryan White Cares Act. Um, that's helped multiple uh, university and treatment sites. OU in Oklahoma City has a Ryan White Clinic. 
OSU has the oldest red and white clinic in Oklahoma, uh, here in you know, Tulsa, Oklahoma. You know, kind of funny though, there's a big stigma about this. And uh, not until 1991 did we start really looking at HIV as not just a uh, male sexually transmitted disease. Uh, in 1991, Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive uh, from multiple possible sexual partners of females he may or may not have known, who knows? And then uh, 2002, we got our first official worldwide treatment uh, guidelines from the WHO organization, uh, the World Health Organization. And then we advanced even further, but not until 2012, where we started using things such as Travada, which is imcentrinibide, and uh, 3TD, the combination of medications, both uh, uh, medications that prevent the replication of the HIV virus as a preventative tool. Uh, and HIV was fairly scary for ER docs in the, because if we got needle sticks from violent patients, um, we were scared we could get HIV. Nowadays, I'm more scared about getting hepatitis C than I am about HIV in the emergency department. Okay, three questions we still have to ask. Why do we still have HIV if we know how to prevent it? Uh, and if we know how to prevent HIV, why is it still being spread? And how we go forward well, the next few slides will kind of help answer that and maybe help you develop some strategies in engaging your patients on how they can prevent HIV and maybe even feeling more comfortable about talking to your patients about some of their practices, whether it be IV drug abuse or casual sex that is unprotected. Now, in this, can we move the bar down so that I can see my slides? We may not be able to, um, but still, thank you, that's perfect. Thank you so much, guys. What you can't see are some technical difficulties here, and they jumped on it and fixed it for me very quickly. We have new diagnosis of HIV, and by class, it's still male to male sexual contact. 24,000, 24,000 just two years ago. Heterosexual contact, though, is now up to 23, almost 25% of the new cases. And we are still seeing a lot of IV drug abuse, sharing of needles where we spread both hepatitis C and HIV, and then a combination thereof. Okay, now, what has really shifted though, and maybe this is a social economic problem, who is getting HIV? 42% of these are African Americans, 42%, both female and male. Uh, Hispanic Americans now comprise 29%, and Caucasian Americans are only 25%. And I want to give a shout out to the Cherokee Nation, Creek Nation, Muscogee Creek Nation, and other Indian nations which have had aggressive programs to reduce the number of Native Americans that are getting HIV. Uh, and their outreach programs are excellent. And we at Oklahoma State University have teamed up with the Cherokee Nation. And so we have seen at least the Native American numbers come down. But who, who and why? Well, there's a lot of socioeconomic factors. People don't want to get tested. Years ago, I can give an example where Puerto Ricans did not want to be tested because Catholic churches were sitting outside of clinics that would do testing, and they were scared that the Catholic priest would see them going in to get a test. We had to finally sit down, we being the uh, CDC and, and Public Health Service had to sit down with the uh, archdiocese in, in Puerto Rico and go, look, you're killing people. And this is why they won't get tested. Now we're gonna have to deal with HIV and AIDS because they're too scared to go get tested because you guys are sitting outside their doors. And finally got through to them years ago. And now the Catholic Church, at least down in Puerto Rico, working very well with preventative measures. Um, but we've got a lot of social issues to overcome. Even our Hispanic populations, the numbers are rising many times because of language barriers. And if clinics can't provide a bilingual person to help them out, they will not go to that clinic. Uh, for example, here in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Health, Health Outreach Prevention Education Organization actually has a van and they go out to the Hispanic communities, to their festivals, to other locations. They will advertise on social media. Hey, we're gonna show up here in this parking lot with our van, come get a test. And uh, we are trying to break down some of those barriers, but we've got a long ways to go. These are contributing factors to why we still have HIV in America. Now, where in America are we having the problems? Look at this graph, look at the bottom of the slide, and you'll see that we're seeing the, a disproportionate number of cases in 
southern United States, from Oklahoma, Texas, all the way over to the Carolinas and Florida, those southern states are the states that we see the most new HIV cases. A lot of socioeconomic factors there. Access to care in rural America. Access to testing where you don't feel like you're going to be watched by your neighbor. Um, language barriers with the immigrants coming in across the border. Multitudes of reasons as to why the southern states have a disproportionate number of new cases compared to the West, the Midwest, and the Northeast. So what can we do? Open those doors wide, find the people and communicate where the care is. Get into the websites that they feel comfortable getting information on. Even after we get that information out to them, having people to, to stay on their medications, to get their viral loads down to zero has been difficult. And these statistics uh, that are shown here by the CDC show that. That 50% of the people who are HIV positive started care many times drift away from care. They'll come and they'll go back and forth from care. The Oklahoma State University and Ryan White Clinic can, uh, can address this uh, on a regular basis. They have two counselors just dedicated to call up people. Hey, where have you been? We need to test you. Are you out of your meds? What do we need to do to help you? And so this is not just in Oklahoma. This is nationwide that we have this problem. Okay. Here's the other kicker. One in seven people do not know they have HIV. One in seven people that don't know that they have HIV are spreading HIV to other people that don't know they have it. Many times this could be male um, uh, having sex, males having sex with males or IV drug abusers. But we need to reach out and communicate to everybody. Everybody needs an HIV test uh, if they've had unprotected sex in a non-monogamous relationship. Everybody needs an HIV test if they've been a drug abuser that has shared a needle. Now, let's, let's switch gears. That's the problem in America. Let's start talking about occupational exposures. That's us, the healthcare worker. What happens if we get a needle stick? What happens if an HIV positive patient bites me? What happens, what happens, what happens? Let's start asking those questions. Let's identify those risks. Let's just define a little bit about what a true exposure is. And let's talk about what we can do. And we can prevent the spread of HIV in these cases 97% of the time or more if we can start medications within 72 hours. That's a big key because in the past we said, okay, if you start it within a week, we can probably help you out. The latest research shows 72 hour window. And I'm going to emphasize that quite a few times during this lecture. We need to get out of our own old mindset and go back to a new mindset. Okay, can we flip that bar back up to the top again? All right, so PrEP, post-exposure protocols, are recommended for people um, who have a, maybe a true needle stick, uh, and we don't need to know what the source is anymore. Used to, we'd say, okay, if you don't know what the source is, we're going to go with four medications. If you do know what the source is, we're probably going to go with three medications. Nowadays, the protocols are written that it doesn't matter, no matter who, we're going to start a free medication protocol unless we find maybe a known source that has a resistance on certain meds where we go to a four drug regime for post-exposure protocol. And what is a post-exposure protocol? It's at least a minimum of three medicines and it's for 28 days. Again, let me emphasize, we need to start that within 72 hours, okay? If we know the status of the patient that the exposure comes from, either a needle stick, a bite, or anything such as, uh, and we'll talk about this in the non-exposure pro protocols, uh, maybe a condom broke, or maybe we have a sexual abuse case uh, where we need to start them on a post-exposure protocol. Um, if we know the source and that source is negative at the time of the exposure, we don't have to test for HIV. We're done. Uh, it doesn't matter if that person later becomes HIV positive. If they did not have an HIV positive test that day and it was negative, there is no chance of spreading HIV at that point, okay? Post-exposure uh, protocol or prophylaxis medication regime should be started as soon as possible is the old way, but the newest literature says less than 72 hours, okay? Now, what types of meds do we use? We use antiviral meds. Oops, you advance me here. I don't have to back it up. There we go. 
Um, and if you have, um, if you can get these medications started, sometimes, many times what we do um, is we'll get a starter pack in an emergency room of the three, of three meds, uh, and then we'll have them follow up with the clinic for the rest of the 24 days. The post-exposure protocol or the, the post-exposure prophylaxis medications need to be given for a total of 28 days. Uh, and maybe even calling the patient once a week to make sure they're taking the medications. Okay. Expert consultation is recommended for any exposure to an occupational uh, HIV situation because those numbers are tracked specifically by a separate group at the CDC. And I'm gonna show you some statistics here in about two or three slides that show who has been um, exposed and who has gotten HIV. You're gonna be a little surprised as to who within our hospitals or our medical clinics actually are getting HIV after a post-exposure uh, situation. Close follow-up, you know, call these folks back in 72 hours. Make sure they've got somebody to talk to in 72 hours after you start them on medications. Uh, good communication will help with the compliance at the end of the day. Yeah, if you're going to use an HIV test on a source patient or on a patient that may have been exposed, I recommend the fourth generation combination HIV test uh, that tests for both the antigen and the antibody. Uh, fourth generation are most accurate, and they cut down one less test in the protocol as far as testing over the next six months. Um, the exception to that is if somebody is found to be hepatitis C, um, and HIV positive might be delayed more than six months. And so we take out uh, further the testing for HIV. So if your exposed patient is hepatitis C positive, then um, we have to uh, probably uh, also test them at six, nine, and 12 months. We'll talk about that at the at towards the end of the session. Oops, there we go. Uh, I think you took control away from me. We're getting there, guys. A little technical difficulties. Here we go. Now I've got control. There we go. Now, what is an actual exposure? Well, the highest risk is when you have a body contact with fluid that enters another body. So let's say we had uh, uh, an HIV positive trauma patient, blood spewing everywhere for whatever reason, an injury, and you get it in your mouth. If you get a mill of blood in your mouth, that's a high risk exposure. You need to be on prophylaxis that day, that minute. Um, now, what are other exposure potentials? Well, IV sharing of needles, that's a big exposure. Uh, when, when somebody shoots up, immediately tries to clean out their needle and they don't do a good job and they give it to their next partner, uh, they just expose them to every germ. And one thing I tell high school to, students too towards the end of this, you know, if you're gonna have sex as a high school student, remember the person you're having sex with, you're having sex with every person they have ever had sex with. It's a little scare tactic, but I'm trying to get those, those kids to maybe be a little bit more responsible and wait on having sex. Abstinence is the best. The other thing would then just be to promote condoms after that. Other fluids, let's get back to this though. Other risk factors. Pleural fluids, cerebrins, uh, uh, cerebral spinal fluid, synovial fluid, probably low risk of transmitting HIV unless you see visible blood, visible blood in those samples, then the risk goes up. Oh, let's back up here. Uh, urine, sweat, tears, feces, saliva, no risk unless you see blood, okay? No risk, but I'd still kind of wear gloves if you're handling those materials. I do, all right? Other potential hazards, any direct contact if you're in a, a virus uh, research lab, such as we have the, uh, the high-risk uh, lab in Stillwater that's across the street from the vet college. Uh, if any of those folk have a direct contact with virus where they're dried or in, in liquid form, um, they need to go on prophylaxis. Uh, for human bites, the clinical evaluation needs to reveal the bitey and the bite or. Uh, because you don't know who may be giving it back and forth to each other in that case. In that case, I'd probably be checking for hepatitis C also and hepatitis B. Those are the three bloodborne pathogens, hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and HIV. Uh, and, and anybody studying for boards? Uh, the board question is, they'll throw in hepatitis A. Hepatitis A is not a bloodborne pathogen. All right, so that's your board question right there. Which of the following are, are bloodborne pathogens? All of the following are bloodborne pathogens except except hepatitis A. Okay, a little board review for some of you out there. Now I talked a few slides ago about 
Who gets HIV in the hospital? The nurses do. They're the most likely. Okay, lab techs, uh, clinical lab techs, maybe the phlebotomist. Physicians, rare, but we do get it. Uh, and lab non-clinical personnel, i.e. the folk that are bringing the blood from one machine to another, but they're not the ones drawing the blood. But here's one I want you guys to keep in mind. Housekeepers. Housekeepers. Now, most hospitals have modified their protocols. We used to let diabetics give their own insulin. We still do sometimes in the hospital, especially when we're training a new diabetic to give their own insulin. However, we no longer let them leave their needle on a tray to be picked up by, oh, let's say housekeeping or picked up by, oh, let's say uh, the kitchen personnel. No, the nurses are standing there now or the text. Patient gives their own shot, hand the needle or uh, pass the needle to a, a medical person, which then immediately puts in a sharps container. From that, we have cut down the number of housekeepers that have gotten needle sticks from cleaning rooms. Surgical techs and embalmers. That was the big surprise for me. And that's a classification that I did not see 20 years ago when we had our initial stats on all of this. Okay. Uh, now, post-exposure testing. What do we need to do? Let's go over this real quickly. Not only for HIV, but maybe we need to consider some hepatitis C. That's a separate lecture. That was Dr. Derby's lecture last month. Did a great job, a colleague of mine at Oklahoma State University. Uh, we need to do a baseline HIV because if they are positive at baseline, the person they got bitten from, the person they had sex with, the person they shared the needle with probably did not give them the HIV. And we're not going to give them post-exposure prophylaxis meds. We're going to start treating them for uh, HIV as soon as we've got at least the, the type of HIV they have and a genotype. If the source patient is negative, if the source that they came from is no negative, no other HIV test is needed, okay? Uh, that I've seen on a board question also. Now, follow-up testing. What else? If we're using the fourth generation, um, then we can, we can do a six-week, a 12-week, and a four-month. If we're using third-generation testing, six weeks, 12 weeks, four months, and six months. However, the exception rule that I mentioned a little bit ago is if they're hepatitis C positive, and on meds for hepatitis C, we need to test them at probably the nine months and the 12 months because the HIV will be delayed in showing itself with the antigen. Public Health Service no longer recommends that the severity of exposure determine the number of drugs. We used to have a three drug regime and a four drug regime. There's only one regime now. One regime, there are modifications. If you're pregnant, there are modifications. If you're certain age groups, there are modifications. Um, if you have certain kidney uh, problems. But the one thing you need to remember is we throw them on something like a Travada, which is a Tinevir uh, TDF uh, and an insentrinibine uh, mix, uh, both retroviral, uh, uh, they prevent the replication of the virus into a DNA form. And the new one, uh, the Tregavir, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing right, that correctly, uh, and uh, Reltegravir. Uh, these are medications that you mix. Now, the nice thing about um, the total trigger is that it's once a day. The problem is, is it costs $1,200 for that once a day medicine for 28 pills. The TD, uh, uh, TDF uh, uh, in mix, Travada, uh, is now down in cost. If you've got a uh, good RX card and you go to a place like Costco, I think it's down to a hundred bucks. So that part of it's fairly cheap. Uh, the Reltegravir is also expensive. And the, the back, the problem with it is it's twice a day. So your compliance goes down. Do not use, do not use Reltegravir in a pregnant patient. Uh, it, it's, it's got bad effects on the pregnancy. Okay, these medications need to be used for 28 days. And they need to have some good close follow-up where we're talking to the patient once a week, once every other week, and say, hey, how are you doing on meds? Are you having any side effects? Do I need to call you any nausea meds? Are you eating well? Are you doing okay? Are you scared? We need to talk to them about that because compliance on this 28 post-exposure prophylaxis goes up if we talk to them about their fears and we talk to them through that. Other testing can be done for hepatitis B, hepatitis C, no, we don't have a vaccine for hepatitis B. We do have vaccine for hepatitis B, but the rate of vaccinations for hepatitis B are going down. 
So maybe we need to address that at the same time as we're addressing some of these issues with the HIV. Timing of PrEP. Annual studies suggest that PEP, post-exposure prophylaxis, is most effective when begun as soon as possible. That's the old statement. Now let's go down the bottom statement. Although animal studies demonstrate PEP is likely to be less effective when started more than 72 hours after exposure. Every article that has come out, and I've got a whole pile of them with me here today, has said, hey, we need to get this started with 72 hours. So if you have an exposure on a Friday night, or our clinics open on a Monday or Tuesday, they're going to show up in my emergency room. So even our emergency room docs need to know what to do. If you don't know what to do, I'm going to have phone numbers for you to call. They'll walk you through it, no matter where you're at or what time of day. We've got you some, some resources to help you out. You don't have to go this alone if you don't feel comfortable with some of these steps. Okay? And here are some uh, places you can go online. Uh, and again, download the uh, lecture slides and you'll have this as, as a reference and I'll have some references towards the end. And now we're gonna go into a little bit different part of this. What is an occupational versus a non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis? The medications are gonna be the same, but I wanna bring up some situations that maybe we haven't thought of all the time that we need to give some attention to. Um, and non-occupational exposure is somebody that may be, okay, um, they used the diabetic needle, but they didn't know the brother who's HIV positive used that needle and they used it. Human bites are spitting, very low risk, non-consensual sex, sexual assault is one of the big ones. Uh, that we have to consider that with. Uh, tainted blood, rarely see that, but every now and then, once in a blue moon, one in I think uh, a, a half a million blood bank uh, products may still transmit in HIV. They are great at, about uh, preventing this, but once in a blue moon, one about uh, 500,000 or even less now with the fourth generation testing, uh, do we get a positive from a blood product, okay? Now, red blood transfusions, still uh, uh, up there, as I just mentioned. Needle sharing is huge. Uh, receptive anal intercourse is the biggest, and the biggest non-exposure uh, protocol that I worry about uh, on, on HIV would be the sexual assaults. Uh, but also, condoms breaking in a discordant relationship. What's a discordant relationship? Uh, let's let's say we have a, a male who is HIV positive and a female who is uh, HIV negative uh, that are married, and, and that, that we call that a discordant relationship. In that case, uh, you know, a, we might want to get them on a, a prophylaxis medication regime uh, uh, when a condom breaks or when they forget to take a medication, or maybe somebody's had a fever and their viral load from the HIV may be going up. Those are situations where we may want to put the other recipient on 28 days worth of uh, prophylaxis. Okay, so what's an exposure? Is a bite a big exposure? If I don't see blood, if they didn't see blood, although unfortunately bites occur usually during fights, bites then trauma to the face, probably going to see blood. But if it's a, a kid biting a kid and we know the kid is uh, HIV uh, uh, negative, we're done. We don't have to do the post-exposure testing. Um, but let's say we've got a kid who's HIV positive, a, a leukemia survivor, had a lot of blood products and, and uh, became HIV positive, like Brian White. Um, then, and they get in a fight with some kid and, and they bite each other. Okay, that's something we'd have to think about. So that's, that's probably a medium exposure. When this occurs, whether it's a needle sharing situation, condom breaks, discordant relationship, does not matter does not matter. If it's less than 72 hours and the known source is HIV positive, we recommend PrEP, okay? PEP, I'm sorry, PEP, not PrEP, post-exposure prophylaxis for the full 28 days. Same medicines we use for the occupational exposure. And then if, this, if the source patient is unknown, it's a case-by-case -case determination. How much blood was involved? Was it a fight? Um, and we kind of go from there. And in that case, I have a phone number for you to call. So you can bounce that case off of somebody and decide what the risk factors are. That's coming up here in a few slides. And then uh, if it's greater than 72 hours and it's non-exposure, non-occupational exposure, we're not starting a post-exposure protocol. 
Okay, if it's greater than 70 towers, it is not recommended. Okay, initiation of uh, in prep, um, obtain a good history. Uh oh, you're blocking my slides again, kiddo. Here we go. Thank you so much. All right, obtain a history from uh, the exposure um, and kind of start making determination. Uh, was this a needle? Was this, you know, how did this happen? Timing of the most recent post, uh, uh, post exposure uh, is important. If it's more than 72 hours, we're not using this protocol. Uh, and the type of event that went around. Do we need to get them into a sexual assault nurse examiner? Do we need to get them in the police involved because this was a potential rape or sexual assault? Uh, if so, we need to start finding resources for the folk in the non uh, occupational exposure. If this, though, is an IV drug abuser that is potentially HIV positive, or we find later through multiple tests that they're not, maybe we need to consider a pre exposure protocol. And we'll talk about that here in about five or six slides. Uh, you took control away from me. There we go. All right, thanks again. Um, now, what testing do we need to do when somebody's had an exposure? and it's a non-occupational. Pretty much the same that we do for the occupational exposures, except we're adding sexually transmitted diseases. We need to check their uh, hepatitis B vaccination status. Uh, we might try some baseline chemistries, as indicated, if, they've got a, if they're older and they've had uh, kidney disease of any sort, uh, then we might need to do a little bit more testing towards that direction. What do we prescribe? What do we do? We do the same thing we do for the post-exposure protocol for occupational exposures. But we need to educate, you know, the nice thing about the medical community, we're pretty much educated on this, but there still may be some good questions from the occupational uh, side. We have, we have, they'll have our um, uh, in-house occupational health services that will help our employees, whereas the patients come in that are non-occupational don't have those resources. We might need to find them some of those resources. If it is a sexual assault, Many times the nurse, the sexual assault nurse examiner program will hook them up with uh, counselors and um, teammates to walk them through the process, even through the court process. We have a great, great system in Tulsa County. I hope everybody in, in America can adopt our system, uh, but we've got to find resources because we need to help these folks out. These medications are many times put on them to have to buy and they have to upfront come up with $1,200, $1,500 at times. But there is, uh, through the Justice Department, the United States Justice Department, a victim's compensation fund that you can tap into. Uh, and at the end of the lecture, I will pull that up and give you that website uh, where maybe you can help some of those folks in those special needs situations. Okay. And what do we give? Well, if you look over to the right, uh, on my right, you're right, the three drug regime, it's the same. It's the Travada, or if you have kidney trouble, the Discovy. And what's the difference between Travada and Discovy? It still has the uh, 3TD uh, and the Imsentritabine, except the uh, mixture of the 3TD or the TDF, as you see, is changed. And what it's made into a compound is changed, and it's a lesser dose of the Tenavir. Uh, it's only 25 milligrams. If it's the Discovery, then the 300 milligrams of the Travada. We still use one of the two other drugs that's listed below, uh, the Deltegravir, uh, which is twice a day, less compliance, or the Deltegravir, uh, which is 50 milligrams once a day, but a lot more expensive. Uh, alternates are there. And again, special needs situations, you may bounce on to some of those alternates. Okay, here's some more hotlines to help you out uh, for both occupational and non-occupational exposures. Um, the uh, University uh, or University College of San Francisco, University of California, San Francisco, has been the base for this for about 15 to 20 years. They have separate hotlines now depending upon your situation. So you, you'll have my handout, and these are the six most used hotlines they have depending upon the situation you have to help you out in determining how to help your patient uh, get through this. Yeah, the big thing, biggest thing that I'm involved with, uh, with the Health Outreach Prevention Education Organization here in Oklahoma is how do we prevent it? How do we just prevent all this from happening? 
who would benefit from a pre-exposure prophylaxis? One of them is anybody that's had unprotected sex and had to be treated, treated for an STI over the last year, probably we need to have a talk with that patient about going on a pre-exposure prophylaxis medication. What labs do we need? What labs do we need and how often do we need to follow these folks? What do I prescribe for PrEP? And we've got a new option that just came out last year. It's an injection. We're going to talk about that a little bit. And what education do we need uh, to do with our patients for all of this? Okay. All of this came out from the newest guidelines from the, the uh, uh, CDC this last year. And, and it's uh, 120 pages, but there's only about 30 pages you need to read. The biggest thing is, is anybody who's sexually active, not in a monogamous relationship, having sex with multiple folk, uh, they probably need to, we need to consider them to be on the pre-exposure protocol. Um, the other thing is, is we've got a new medication, uh, and I hope I pronounce this cor the, correctly. The short term is CAB, C-A-B, but Kevotigravir, I hope is how you pronounce it. And it's an injection you can give every two months. And uh, we're gonna work that into our protocols here. Okay, resources for this, I'm listing here for you. Uh, so down again, download the handout. You've got a lot of places you can go to help you out. You are not alone doing this. And then let's really get into the meat of PrEP. This is for both men and women. Uh, we've got HIV on both sides of the aisle. In that African-American category that I showed you in the very first of this, a lot of those now are women. Up to one third, depending upon what city you're in, are African-American females who are getting HIV. So don't just think this is an IV drug abuser or a, a male having a sex with male problem. It is no longer that. And our stats have changed over the years. When I started giving this talk, type of talk 20, 25 years ago, 90% were males having sex with males. Not anymore. Well, those numbers have now gone up to about a quarter to a third are now female, depending upon what city you're in or what demographic we're talking about. So we need to approach both men and women who have unprotected sex or share needles about pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, okay? Yeah, men uh, daily who are on PrEP, um, there are, we can give PrEP to anybody, PrEP being Travada, uh, which is the 3-TDF or TAF, which is the new formulation, the Discovy, uh, to anybody who's at least 35 kilograms or heavier, 77 pounds or more. That's what the studies went down to, uh, that have risky sexual behaviors. Now, little trick here though, transgendered women, persons assigned as a male sex at birth who decided to trans, um, uh, to change into a female uh, who have sex with men, those also need to be considered for PrEP, uh, but we might need to modify what medication they're on uh, because certain medications are not necessarily safe in that demographic. Okay, who else do we consider? Commercial sex workers, uh, IV drug abusers. Okay, who should? Uh, what tests do we need to do before we start somebody on prep? Pre-exposure protocols. Uh, we need to do an HIV test because if they're HIV positive, we're not using prep. We're using a different combination of medications to start treating that HIV. Um, and we need to know what the renal function is. We want their GFR to be greater than uh, 60 mils per minute squared, I think is the, uh, the uh, units on that. Um, and because lower than 60 is a, a stage three uh, chronic renal disease. We need to test for hepatitis B or test to see if they're immune from prior immunizations. And uh, we probably need to go ahead and test for hepatitis C the first time, especially in males who have sex with males and IV drug use. And uh, we offer sexually transmitted disease testing at the Hope Clinic um, before we start them on PrEP. And thank goodness uh, most of that testing can be free or at a very reduced rate or cost. Um, and uh, we can get them in a lot quicker than the city can and health department can. Uh, now, if you're going to use the Tenavir products, we need to know what their, their renal status is. And if the renal status is changing while on it, then we may change them from the uh, original Travada, which is 300 milligrams of tenavir, to uh, 25 milligrams, which is mixed differently of the tenavir, which is also called SCOBY, uh, in that mix with the MSEN Trinavine. And we need to check it every three months, or at least the first time, three months after we start the pre-exposure prophylaxis, and then maybe every six months after that. Now, if you're starting to see kidney changes, though, after three months, 
it's every three months. Um, and then um, you might want to go ahead and study once a year, check their lipid count, because the imcentrinibine tenavir um, combination can uh, raise your lipid profile a little bit higher. Uh, testing renal status is not needing, though, is not needed with the new one that's out, uh, the cabtigravir, the cab. Uh, and that's a, uh, I am injection. It's given every two months. So you're testing HIV every two months, but it does not affect the kidneys. This is now, right now, before the CDC. Uh, and as of December of last year, I had not read that it had been fully approved, but it's before them to be considered for approval for uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, but as of this lecture, not yet, but all of my guidelines say get ready. All of my guidelines say get ready that this is a potential for us to use, okay? We do, do we have choices if they're over 50? Yeah, we can go with the cab. Do we have kidney disease? Yeah, we'll go with the, uh, the Discovy instead of the Travada. Uh, are they taking your medications once a day? If you have a patient that is poor taking their medications, they don't want to take a medication every day, then maybe we should put them on the, uh, the cab uh, medication and give them a shot once every two months, okay? If they skip meds, they have trouble getting to their meds, they're homeless, the, the injection would be the best way to go, okay? Uh, if they're less than 50 years old, I'm not so much worried about kidney disease, then I start them on the cheaper Truvada, the Incentrinibide, which is 200 milligrams of Tenavir, uh, this Proxel, which is a 300 milligram, versus if they're over 50 or I'm worried about kidney disease, it's the Incentrinibide, 200 milligrams of Tenavir, Alphamide, uh, 25 milligrams, and that mix uh, is less likely to affect the kidneys, but still, does a great job on preventing HIV transmission. If the patient is not med taking medications or misses them, like I'm saying, I think the uh, uh, Cabtigravir, 600 milligrams IM every two months is a great way to start. However, we start them on the oral medication, 30 milligrams daily for the first uh, 30 days uh, prior to the first injection. So we can see if there are any side effects that this person may or may not experience that are different than what we see with the Travada and the disability. Okay, PrEP does not stop other STIs. And this is my biggest frustration, preaching to the young generation. You know, they, they want free sex. They want to be able to use their drugs. They want to, you know, that's a frustration with me. It's probably a frustration with you. I just want to admit it up front. We have to educate that. What I'm talking about today does not prevent chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, which are very high across all the United States right now, probably more because of COVID and nothing else to do, but maybe have sex on the side, uh, unprotected and with multiple partners. This does not stop other STIs, and we need to emphasize this with the, with the patients, that if they're not in a monogamous relationship, they might still need to use a condom. They might need to clean their needles a little better. This is a big frustration. We'll go on that. We won't, we won't believe that any longer. Educate that we need to educate the post folks about side effects. Nausea is one of the big side effects of the oral medication and other drug drug interactions that could occur with some of these medications. And the pharmacists do a great job when they first get their meds of educating are you on this med, you're on this med. Okay, we need to adjust the time you take that med to, uh, versus when the time you take this med. And our pharmacists, especially our, our farm D guys over at Oklahoma State University, are great about working with the, the Ryan White clinic patients on some of that. Okay, yeah, a new thing out there that I'd like to talk about. The cost of these medications are high. So compliance with the pre-exposure prophylaxis has been hit and miss over the years. I think we can do a great, a better job, uh, especially with our socially, economically um, challenged patients with a different protocol called 211. And so where we were taking a medication every day or a shot every two months, 211 is a kind of an on-demand uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. This is where we take two of the Travada or Discovy pills recommended two to 12 hours prior to any potential sexual contact, and then one medication each day, 24 hours after whenever you initiated the first. And uh, the foreign studies show that this has a good efficacy, not as good as taking it every day not as good as taking it every day where we have a 97% prevention rate. This drops down to about the 93, 94% prevention rate as far as transmitting HIV. 
both with their IV drug abusers and uh, non-monogamous sexual contact. Based on the trial experiences, uh, it's two pills, two to 24 hours before sex. However, the most recent literature recommends two to a minimum of 12 hours. They're really pushing for that 12 hour mark minimum before they have sex or use IV drugs. And one pill 24 hours after that and another pill 48 hours after, after that. However, if they're gonna have sex on or use drugs on consensual days or consecutive days, you start the protocol over or you start them on, on a daily prevention because 211 won't work after that third or fourth day uh, if you're using drugs or having sex every day, okay? Based on the timing of sexual, sexual contact, uh, males who have sex with males should be instructed to take additional doses like I'm just talking about, extend that 211 to 211111. But continue it, or if, if they're going to have sex more than two or three times a week, they just need to be on a daily regime and not a 211 protocol. A gap of less than seven days occurs, um, start over and resume one pill a day. If it's more than seven days, start at the two pills. Okay, what do I mean by that? If they only have sex on Friday night, they only do drugs on Friday night because they're a recreational drug abuser, then 211 is perfect. Uh, but if, they're, if their next encounter is less than seven days, maybe we need to consider the daily protocol. Okay? Some uh, folk may decide to use off-label 211. This is now in all three of the protocols I've read from CDC. Um, but folk that don't want to spend all the money because maybe they have, they have sex or use drugs once a month, this is a perfect protocol for them to go on. Cheaper, affordable. Compliance is very high. When I do a, a prescribe a 211 protocol, uh, then I only prescribe 30 pills. And maybe I only have to see them uh, every six months uh, for a refill. And at that time, I'm going to get their labs uh, lot the same as I do with the daily protocols for pre exposure prophylaxis. Okay. Here are some resources for you guys. Um, and a lot, again, download my handout, it has a lot in it. And if you have any questions, uh, here's how to contact me, except I've got to give a little warning. A lot of you guys have been following me on Facebook. Tomorrow I go in for a treadmill. If I flunk the treadmill, tomorrow I'm getting a heart cath. Started having some chest pain about two weeks ago. Uh, everything's going okay. I'm not ignoring this. I'm jumping on this now. I've got great cardiologists through St. Francis, which I've worked for for three years, not retiring until April 24th. April 24th is my last day at St. Francis Hospital South. Uh, but right now, what I'd like to do is open it up to questions. I've got somebody that's going to field those for me, and we'll kind of go from there. Go ahead and read them to me, Ken. Okay, we have one from Patricia Oxman. There was mention of allowing HIV positive people to donate blood. Is this safe? Okay, is it safe for HIV positive folk to donate blood? This is a controversial thing that I think will be ended this. This is what protocols are being looked at. It's not yet approved, not yet approved, okay? But if they are, if their viral load is zero for six months in a row, then they may consider letting those folks go ahead and donate blood. This has not been accepted. It is in committee now, but that should be out of committee by the end of this year or the beginning of next year as to a decision on that. So the protocol they're looking at in the future is not approved, is viral load zero, six months in a row or greater, okay? Do you know of any free HIV testing in the Tulsa area? Do I know of any free? Uh, <laughs> that was a softball. Oh, I, I wonder who gave me that question. Jason Sims. Jason Sims. Uh, yes, uh, please come to Hope. Uh, health Outreach Prevention Education to our website. Brand new, beautiful website. We'll schedule for a test. And if you're interested in getting on PrEP, uh, either myself, Dr. Matt Else, uh, Dr. Ron Jackson's wife, Janet Jackson, uh, which is a doctor of nurse practitioner, uh, works with us and is on our board. We three are there many times with medical students from Oklahoma State University and sometimes residents from uh, OU. Thank you, Janelle Witt, for sending some of your residents to uh, come out with us. And so we do that in the Tulsa area. Look at the uh, at the Hope website, hope.org. Okay. Hope testing, hope testing dot org. Yes. There it is. There it is. Thank you so much. Do you continue continue post-exposure treatment 
uh, for the full month or do you stop if the source HIV patient comes back negative? We stop if we know the source patient is negative the minute we know they're negative. Great, great question, Larry. Thank you so much. Okay. What else do we have popped up there? Do we have any for first? Or somebody who wanted me to talk about something at the end? And that was in one of the very first. Are there savings programs for these medications? Oh, are there are there coupon, basically coupon programs, I think is another way of saying it, for these programs? Yes, Gilead has a great one right now. Um, we have, uh, at Hope, have teamed up with the 340B Pharmacy that's out of Oklahoma City. Eventually, will also be housed in our facility. And that 340B Pharmacy, and many of your 340B pharmacies can do this. They have great ways of finding insurance for these folks. And if not, they help uh, navigate the paperwork to get them on the coupon programs. And I would say 99% of the folks that want to be on a pre-exposure protocol um, uh, can get it pretty much for free. Now, post-exposure protocol, a little bit harder because that's a three-drug regime. And that third drug is the one that is so expensive. And the, that, if it goes through an occupational health nurse, and it can be picked up by a hospital if it's an occupational exposure, but the non-occupational exposures we're still having trouble with. And again, though, our 340B pharmacies are helping us uh, in finding some resources for those folks. What is the prognosis of someone with an age-defining illness who has started on treatment? Oh, that's a that's a loaded question. I think that one's a better question for the Ryan White Clinic. Uh, I can only give you a little bit of limited data that came up in some of the things, but uh, let me back up and let me repeat the question. First of all, what is the prognosis for somebody who has HIV and has been diagnosed with some of the criteria that meet AIDS, AIDS? HIV does not mean you have AIDS, but if you meet some of the criteria that, that are AIDS or, or towards AIDS, what if we start them on meds, what, do, what is their prognosis? A lot of that depends upon the viral load and the illnesses that they have, the comorbidities they have at the time. The biggest thing that we're really pushing now is a rapid start program for anybody who's diagnosed with HIV. And the faster we can get them on an HIV med, the less likely they will ever have AIDS. So if we can get their viral load down to zero as quickly as possible with a fast diagnosis of HIV, then we can prevent anybody long term from having AIDS. There are, there is one. Resistant to uh, uh, HIV-1 in America, the M185, I think, is the one that's out there um, that we can see pop up, especially if somebody's been on the, um, the cab shot and decide to just go cold turkey and not start on something uh, before they switch off of the cab shots. They are a higher likelihood to get the resistant form of HIV uh, during about a 30 to 45 day window post uh, stopping uh, or post two months out from stopping their cap shots. Okay. And thank you, Stephen. That was a great question. 